Mandy. Thanks, Robert. Um, hi, family. My name is Mandy. I am an alcoholic. Hi, hey, Mandy. Hey. 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 Mandy. Lots and lots and lots. Hey, How much? Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Love you, too. Um, well, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to 5D, um, and especially Sarah. Uh, Sarah reached out to Kiki Paw, which is the Kentucky Conference for Young People in AA, asking if we would, you know, help find some speakers for uh, Wednesday nights for September. It's been a great honor, um, and it's always um, a privilege to be able to share my experience, strength, and hope, um, you know, in the, in the primary purpose that we have, which is to help those that suffer. And um, so a few qualifiers, I got a sobriety date, that's uh, October 13th of 2015. Oh. I, I have a sponsor. Um, she knows where I'm at physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally most of the time. I think it's important that I stay accountable with somebody in that regard um, to ensure, you know, consistent um, accountability, open-minded and honest um, ways of thought in regards to recovery. And um, I've uh, got a home group. If you're ever in Northern Kentucky, it is the Tuesday night meeting at six uh, at six thirty. Uh, we meet at the Life Learning Center at the Young People's Meeting, and um, it's been truly an honor to be a part of that meeting because we've been really showing a lot of young, new alcoholics what it looks like to have fun and still take your sobriety seriously. And um, I actively sponsor other individuals who identify themselves as alcoholics. So quick, like what it was like, what happened and what it's like today. Um, I first found Alcoholics Anonymous at the age of 17 in 2012. And um, I, uh, I got sober at the time due to consequences. A lot of the things I had done with the lifestyle that comes with drinking and using other substances uh, really caught up to me. And uh, I used to roll with a group of people uh, in Chicago, which is where I'm originally from. Uh, where we would joke like our full-time job was like robbing cars and houses for a living um, and really like we weren't you know we weren't like pawning the stuff off to get money to serve to survive financially we were getting money in order to have money to party with um, and to pick up outside issues with and um, sooner and later then uh, that same group of people robbed my home and the high school I was a part of um, they got word of it. I was already failing at everything. Um, they were already threatening to expel me. And they said, um, if you go to treatment, uh, we won't kick you out of school. So that's what I did. And, um, you know, the only like really drunk a log story I'll give you, uh, is about my first drink for me. It's a daily reminder that I was off to the races from day one. I was 14 years old. Dad was out of town. I got a handle of vodka. Um, with myself and two of my girlfriends and uh, we got good and drunk and at the time I didn't think there was anything wrong with this but in hindsight looking back like from the first time alcohol met my lips I knew that I um, I was different and I wanted more because we all got good and drunk and the difference was I proceeded to uh, shove my stomach into the porch railing over and over in order to puke off the side and my friends, they were like, oh, my God, like, are you okay? What's wrong? And I turned around, and I gave this, like, cute little giggle because I was kind of white girl wasted, you know. And, um, and I said, yeah, I'm totally fine. I just have room for more. Um, and that is exactly how my drinking looked from day one. Um, it was, you know, I would have bouts of sobriety, uh, whether they were intentional or not. But, you know, the doctor, in the doctor's opinion, writes, like, the difference between alcoholics like me and your normal drinkers is like I have this phenomenon of craving, like I'm an allergy to alcohol. So like the minute I put alcohol in my body, I will not stop unless I black out, pass out, or something interferes with my ability to put more into my body. Like if a friend is like, you're done, we're cutting you off, you know. So anyways, I um, went to treatment at 17, found Alcoholics Anonymous, got involved with young people in AA very quickly. I love young people in AA. Um, but the difference was um, I worked the YPOP program for two years and nine months of sobriety. Um, and I say that because um, I had never fully worked the steps. 
um, those promises we read. Um, fun fact, those are actually the ninth step promises. Um, I never really wanted to fully register that at the time. I thought I could get those ninth step promises without working the ninth step. Um, and a lot of them did come true for me in sobriety. Like by the time I had relapsed, I had the car, I had the job, I was like a manager of a retail store and going to school full time, getting good grades, getting money, I had the guy. And it was this mentality of like, my life looks good on the outside, so like I must be okay. So I came up with this jargon of like, I want to have a normal college experience, right? Um, and like, I went as far as like, looking at developmental psychology with like the brain and being like, well, like, you know, my brain has developed more since like my teens and now I'm in my 20s. Um, so I drank, you know, and what's funny is like, I had two ideas of what my drinking was going to look like. And one was like this typical college experience where like I go to the sorority parties, the frat parties, um, and I'd have fun on the weekends and I'd function and everything would be fine. Um, and then I also had this idea that I'd go out on Friday nights, like a lot of, uh, a lot of my sponsees hear me say this, like I joke that I wanted to live that like Lana Del Rey lifestyle, right? Like I'd go to these, I, I wanted to go to these sleazy jazz bars in Chicago and like find a man and we were going to like drink lots of wine and champagne on his boat and he's going to like whisk me away, right? Like my mind completely romanticized the idea of my relation, what my relationship with alcohol was going to look like. In reality, I went to two college parties and I followed it up with three months straight of isolated binge drinking in my father's basement. So there was really nothing glamorous about it. And, um, you know, a lot, I've talked to a lot of people about like the whole idea of like your last night out, right? A lot of us like to think we're going to have one last good hurrah, but really like our last night out is not what we expect it to be. Um, some people like know me in my personal life, like I'm a total rocker chick, like a metal head. Um, my last night out was a Toblo concert. If you don't know who Toblo is, it's like white girl pop music. Um, and so I woke up the next day, October 13th, and I had gotten a ton of text messages and calls from people in the program letting me know that um, a girl that I had sponsored my first bout of sobriety had died that morning. And I don't know what it was, but, like, God, like, removed this obsession from me instantly. Like, I was turned off to the idea of alcohol. I thought, like, to drink or drug in her name would, like, completely deface her memory. Um, so I, I totally, like, white-knuckled it. I stayed sober on my own for a week, found myself at her funeral. Um, and I truly believe that at that funeral is where I experienced my first spiritual experience. Um, they, that got me sober again because I remember sitting in this church and it was an open casket funeral and I looked at her body laying there and I looked down at the funeral pamphlet and I looked back up and I swear I saw my body laying there and it scared the absolute crap out of me um, like I just shook instantly and I called a very good friend of mine and I was like I need to go back to AA like there was no doubt about it. I don't know what happened at that meeting that I came back to, but I do know I cried the whole time. I shook uncontrollably the whole time. I was living in a lot of guilt, shame, fear, and remorse. I thought like that if I would walk back into an AA meeting, my head would like set in flames and like everyone was gonna shun me. Um, and in reality, it was nothing but love. It was like endless hugs. Like I think there must've been like 20 people in that room and like every one of them hugged me. And they were like, we're so glad you're back. Like, thank God you're alive. Like, we love you. Stay, you know. Um, and I stayed. And all I remember in the beginning was I cried for a week straight in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I cried because I was grieving. I cried because I was blaming myself. I was playing the pity party. Um, and I would like to tell you I had the gift of desperation enough to work the steps, but I didn't. Um, and thank God, like, the meetings in Alcoholics Anonymous and the people and YPA carried me through um, to when I was 14 months sober, I was desperate enough to work the steps. Um, and that is what truly revolutionized my life. Um, was com I hit an emotional bottom. I had done some things in sobriety that I couldn't believe I let happen to me. And it was poor me, poor me, 
you know, I wrote this unmanageability list with my sponsor and she gave me very practical solutions for the things that were unmanageable in my life. And most of them entailed work the steps, do a four step, wait until your ninth step, um, you know, start saving up a little bit of money with each paycheck, start making a routine calendar because by that time I was 14 months so sober and still not even like showering or brushing my teeth like regularly. I was not taking care of myself. And um, she looked me in the eye and she said, like, if you stick with me and if you work these steps in two months, she gave me this like two month time frame. She was like, I guarantee you that every single thing on this list will feel a little bit more manageable by the end. And it sounds crazy, right? Um, but she didn't lie. She did not lie at all. And I remember um, I've always, you know, the big book tells me that like the stories disclose, like um, they not only show us in a general way what it used to be like, but it also like, they also tell me how other individuals found God through the steps. And my first real like God experience with steps was in the ninth step. I had made a lot of amends and I was sitting on this one amends to my mom and I was like sitting at this old timers meeting at the first step house in Des Plaines, Illinois and I was like being cranky about it. I was like I don't want to call my mom like how am I supposed to make an amends to my mom and say like mom I'm sorry that you were ill-equipped as a parent you know like I still had so much resentment against her I didn't know how to show her love and um I'll never forget this. Like, there was this old, angry Irishman named Sean, and he walked up to me after the meeting, and he waved his finger at my face, and he said, young lady, I can't do Irish accents, but if you can imagine an Irish accent, it, it'll sound kind of like this. It's like, young lady, if you don't call your mother by next week, and I see you at this meeting again, I'm going to put my foot up your ass, and I don't know what it was, because, like, people threaten me all the time in AA, right, but for some reason, God chose to, like, be an angry Irish man and it and I heard him and I went home right after that meeting and I called my mom and two days later I took her out to dinner and I made amends to her and in that moment the things I said to her were absolutely not me like I spoke to her with unconditional love and I like you know apologized for the things that I had done and I had told her like today I'm ready to be your daughter and show up for you if you'll have me and um, I left that amends like completely euphoric you know like com like utterly rocketed into the fourth dimension like everything just seemed brighter i felt lighter um and again like mandy doesn't say those kinds of things in amends like that had to be god and um you know like moving forward um to me like today you know sponsorship is a huge part of um, my recovery. Uh, when I can't see God in myself, I see God in the eyes of my sponsees every single day. Um, it has been an amazing experience to do that same unmanageability list at step one and take another individual through the steps and be able to see them at the end, the other side of the steps, and see that everything on their list has become a little bit more manageable, right? Like, I get to sit sponsees down today and look them in the eyes and say, like, if you give me two months, your life is going to change and know it and believe it and know that I'm not lying to them. Um, and, you know, like, sobriety has given me a life beyond my wildest dreams, right? People say that all the time, but it's even beyond dreams because um, I didn't really do much dreaming when I was drinking. I was just drinking. You know, the only dream that I had when I was drinking was, like, thoughts of suicide. Um, and today, like I get to show up and I get to be accountable. Um, like I'm sure some of you have seen, like there's, there's this really dark room that says Kiki Pa 2018 host. Um, and there's like seven or eight people in that room, like all having like a viewing party. Um, and I've got, you know, people from all around this country right now tuning in. And like, it shows me that like, um, I don't have to be alone as long as I choose not to be, um, as long as I continue to pick up the phone and you know and work these steps um i have experienced a lot of different combinations of the steps right like working the why path step working no steps working the steps without god um the only like the only thing that has ever worked for me in this program is having an open mind enough to let god into my life and let him like take the wheel you know and um 
you know, and today, like, I was just reflecting a little bit with um, a sponsee yesterday, like the ideas of fear, right? I, I've been really thinking about that a lot lately. Um, we had a really good meeting on Tuesday about fear, and um, and I don't have to like live in fear of others anymore, right? Um, in in my line of sponsorship, I have a group chat with all of my siblings, and uh, one of my siblings brought up this whole idea of um, you know like having people from the past come back to like almost haunt you and um my sponsor always repeats like has always repeated to me like you know do you want what they have and most of the time it's no like the people that have opinions or the people that i live in fear of it's just a people pleasing thing um and most of the time i say no and she's always like then why do you care <laughs> you know um when i allow god into my life and my heart like i can walk through life i can I can do things. I can have uncomfortable phone calls with my parents. I can have uncomfortable conversations at work. Um, I can. I work in treatment today, helping um, alcoholics in early recovery, and like I can have those uncomfortable conversations, and I get to share some experience. Um, I don't know if we're allowed to swear on this, but like just the other day, like I'm. I can also not fear others, where I can literally say, "Fuck your feelings," you know, like. I, uh, I said that to a client that was like whining at one of the treatment homes the other day um, because like this is a program of action. It's not a program of feeling. I spent a long time worshiping my fears and my feelings, um, but it's a matter of like picking up the phone, getting in the car, going to a meeting, you know, going on a sober adventure um, and also just like hitting your knees and asking God for help. So um, I'm starting to hear my voice. So with that, I'm going to shut up and remain teachable. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Mandy. You, Mandy. Thank you, Mandy. Great.